by prayer. stand with me while I read from the fifth chapter of James and then remain standing. Are any of you suffering hardships? You should pray. Are any of you happy? You And a half years. Then, when he prayed again, the sky sent down rain, and the earth began to yield its crops. In light of his sermon this morning about prayer, let us now bow our heads and give thanks. Holy Father, mighty God, please forgive us of our sins as we approach you now in this wonderful avenue of prayer. As Jesus' disciples asked him, Father, and we ask him now again, and you and your Holy Spirit, please teach us how to pray. Please help us to make sure we do it correctly according to your will, knowing that we are, are, are you on that great throne and that we are nearing your presence as close as we can be in this life. Holy One, we pray you'll be with Jack as he delivers this message from your word. Please give him the power of your word to help us understand. And Father, we do pray for every saint here, the sick, afflicted, sorrowing, all through the whole world. We thank you that we can come to you. Please help us, Father, to center our mind upon your word at this time. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Glad to be back with you this Sunday and uh, see everybody. We have so much to be thankful for, and uh, that's why we just come to gather and worship our God because He is the source of all our good gifts, and we just always want to thank Him by our worship. You know, growing up, my dad taught me one thing: he says if you ask enough questions, you can do anything. And I took that seriously because I watched him and said, Dad, do you know how to rebuild an engine, a truck? He says, no. Well, how are you going to do it? Well, I'm going to ask questions. And he did. He rebuilt an engine, a little easier back then perhaps. But I watched him build houses, repair cars, load ammo, I mean, do electrical work, just by figuring it out by asking questions. What a gift. And, you know, that's really in our life when we see someone excel at something, we ask, could you show me how to do that? Because we're always looking for a better way. We're looking for the way things work. And so perhaps that's why there's so many shows on TV, like how to do day trading, 
or how to lose weight, or uh, the latest one out is how to flip houses. I can never understand that. If you're making so much money day trading, why would you have to have a show to show other people? You don't need to sell books, do you? I never could figure that out. But anyway, I digressed. But we're always looking for the way to do things better so we can excel. Now, the problem in my life is maybe I'm true to my name, a jack of all trades, but not master of none. I don't do anything really, really well. So don't ask me to help you. You'll be sorry in the end. But there's one thing that I do know. And that's that Jesus prayed. When I look at scripture, I see that all powerful people in the old, men and women alike, prayed. Noon and night. Jesus, in Hebrews 5, when he spent his life in the flesh, he was known for crying out with loud tears to his father. And he was heard, it says in that text, because of his reverence. Away, and the disciples would look for him. Finally, they came to a point the disciples said, Lord, just teach us how to pray. There's something about prayer. And we said that at the beginning of this year, we would talk about evangelism and prayer, and we want to finish talking about prayer because there's something about it. The more we know about it, perhaps the more difficult it becomes. We all, any discussion about prayer should never make someone feel guilty about not praying because prayer isn't just a checklist, a duty to be spiritual. Prayer is a blessing where we get to communicate with our God. And so it never should be guilt-driven. It's a privilege that we look forward to enjoying. So then why do we have so much trouble with it? Maybe it's because the God that we do, that we ask ourselves, maybe consciously, why am I to go pray to him? Why would he give me, I don't know the have enough trust in the power of God to answer our prayers because we're just trying to work things out ourselves. You know, be independent. Challenge, I'll just fix it because you're supposed to rise up and be a man and just get it done. But Jesus depended upon God for everything. And he showed that dependence by his life of prayer. And so we want to look at what makes prayer powerful. And the text that was read for us by JC is a powerful text because it just tells us not once, but several times, pray, pray. And it can be overwhelming because there's questions about calling for the elders when you're sick, anoint them with oil. If they have sins, they'll be forgiven them. You know, what's being talked about here? It can be kind of confusing, but really the, the message is really simple. It's just found in chapter 5 and verse 16, the latter half of that verse, the prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, the New American Standard says the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. Now, if we just stop there, we've just taken a skim milk approach to this text. It's the kind of thing that would go on a coffee cup, right? And maybe you have one of these in your house or a plaque that says, you know, uh, confess your faults one another and pray because the prayer of a righteous man, he'll, you know, accomplish much. Those are nice sayings, but they can't be reduced to cliches. We have to have a deeper understanding of what the Lord is trying to teach us here about the power of prayer. And not just have a skim milk understanding, but a more meatier understanding. And the simple message is, well, just simply this, prayer is powerful. When you pray. And that's all that you have to understand. Prayer is powerful when we pray. And the reason it's not powerful is because we simply sometimes don't pray. Now, our pray has to be characterized by faith in God. That's all in the text. And we just want to look at just two simple points. First of all, powerful prayers are made by people that pray. It's just that simple. And the power in prayer, second of all, is in the person that we're praying to. The power is found in God. 
Then we'll finish by looking at a powerful example of prayer. So notice we're going to have a lot of power in this lesson. <laughs> and the power is not here. It's in the power of prayer. So let's look at the first idea as you open your Bibles to James chapter 5, if you have not already. That we find in the book of James, which Sam is teaching on Sunday nights, it's a great practical book, that James is writing to these Christians who have been dispersed and counted all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. He says, why? Knowing the testing of your faith produces endurance. See, they're suffering. They need endurance. They're getting weary. And I know all of us have gone through that in life. So the trials of just the physical uh, experiences or spiritual or relation, they press down upon us and sometimes we get weary and sometimes we just want to quit. So James starts with that discussion. Then in chapter 5, he ends with that discussion about trials and also about persevering or, or having endurance. So notice in chapter 5, verse 8, be patient, strengthen your hearts, just like a farmer waits for his crop. And then he says, if you want to think of an example of endurance, verse 11, you've heard of the endurance of Job. So this is all about the theme, again, of enduring under trials. So then finally he gets to our text in verse 13. He says, I'm going to give you the solution. And he says, is anybody suffering? Now, they're all going to say, well, yeah, that's why we're scattered. That's why we've been running, because we're being persecuted. So I just ask that of yourselves. Is anybody here suffering? What's the answer that he says? Pray. You mean it's that easy? Yeah. Because prayer is powerful. Then he goes on. Is anyone sick? We're in verse 14. Oh, is that spiritual, physical? It doesn't really matter because it's the, the concept is how are you going to endure? How are you going to overcome when it gets really tough? Well, here he says, let him call for the elders. I don't know when the last time this has ever happened in my life, period. Let him call for the elders of the church and let them, that's the elders, because they're righteous people or else they shouldn't be elders. Let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith... Notice all the words prayer. Let him pray over them. The prayer offering of faith will restore the one who's sick. So if you're suffering, what's the answer again? Pray. And then notice now in verse 16. Therefore, confess your sins. Sometimes we suffer because of sin and temptation. Sometimes we're beat down and we just want to quit because we just can't conquer the flesh. So he says, well, confess your sins to one another. And where's the answer right there? Pray for one another so you may be healed. And then here's the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish a whole lot. Prayer is powerful when we pray. If you're suffering, he says pray. If you're sick, he says then pray. Why? Because praying is what makes the difference. Righteous man availeth much. The word effective really means the one that is working his prayer. He's working, he has a life of prayer. It's not something that he does rarely, but it's something that he's accustomed to. And so he prays constantly. That same word is used back in James. Don't be a hearer of the word only, a doer. Because if you become an effectual doer, it says, you'll be blessed in what you do, not what you don't do, not what you think about. And the same thing could be said here. The effectual prayer will be blessed in what he or she prays. It's not what you think about. It's not what you want. It's not what you hope you had. things happen. You say, well, that sounds just way too simple. Well, there's a disposition that we have to come to because before we even open our mouth. And the first one is humility. 
It's interesting when he said, if anyone sin, confess your sins and let them pray, and you're, you're going to be forgiven. Satan is so clever. He knows as Christians that we are trying to separate ourselves from the world and, and follow God so we can walk with him, so we can live with him. But we also realize how majestic and holy he is. And we struggle, don't we, in trying to be holy like God is holy. So Satan uses those moments that we sin and our awareness of it to shame us and to guilt us into not praying to God. He's very good at it. He said, he's not going to listen to you. I mean, look at you. You just keep doing the same thing or it's in one thing after another. He's not going to listen to you. That's the self-talk that we feed ourselves. But the truth be told, it's only the humble person that is acutely aware of his own sinfulness compared to God that God in this place. It's the person that says, well, I think I'm good enough to talk to God today. He's self-righteous. God will not listen. In the temple, remember, the, the tax gatherer and then the Pharisee. The Pharisee said, I'm glad I'm not like him. And he said, I tax and I pray and I tithe. And then what did Pharise, the publican say, the tax gatherer? He beat his breast and was not even willing to look to God. He said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That's the only attitude of humility that God will accept in prayer. So the moment you feel like unworthy, that's when you should get on your knees because that's when you have an open communication with God if you'll confess those sins, that unworthiness. Also, prayer forces us to acknowledge reliance on God due to work our own life out. I don't know when that happens that we get to a point like, I can't do anything right. I mean, I can't control the weather. We had thunder and lightning when we were on the vacation, Ann and I, and it's just, it was beautiful, but it's not like what, what we planned to do, to stay in a room watching the pour down rain. We can't control the weather. You can't control, you know, the economy. You can't control the food sometimes you eat because there's these E. coli now in the lettuce. Did you know that? You just, you really were out of control of most things in life. And there's something beautiful about prayer when we're humble and direct my own step, much less controlling around me. So I'm appealing to you because you're in control of everything. It's when we finally yield to him in prayer and say, God, help me. He says, there's someone I can help. Because finally, I get it. And that's what happens in prayer. It takes humility and trust. Look back in chapter 4 of this same book, James 4 and verse 2. He says, you lost and you don't have. So you commit murder and you're envious, you can't obtain, so you fight and quarrel. And he says, you do not have, and here it is, because you don't ask. Is it that simple? Yeah. You don't have because you just don't pray. You don't ask for it. You mean it's really just that easy? Yes. Now, let me just be careful. You mean I can ask for anything and God's going to answer it? Don't treat God like a genie in the bottle. So I would never do that. Well, let's just test that. If I look back on my own prayer life and the times I find myself praying to God is when I need something, when I'm in trouble, when I'm in over my head. So I finally go to him and pray, God, help me. And then he helps me and I put the lid back on prayer and put it away. And if you say the words correctly in the right order, it, poof, it'll happen. Prayer is just communication. How many mothers or wives say, my talk to me? And all they want is a conversation. Well, that's because we're communication. And our God wants to talk with you. And we know in James, uh, Matthew chapter 7, what well, Jesus put it this way, ask, and it will be given to you. It's that simple. Someone asks for a loaf, we'll give him a stone. He's equating prayer and seeking God in prayer as a father-child relationship. 
Or if he asks for fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? No, he's going to help his child because he loves him and he wants to help his child be successful. So here's the question Jesus asked. If you then, being evil, unlike God, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father? Did you hear that? Yes, he's majestic. Yes, he's holy. Yes, I should fall on my face before him, but he's my father. And that makes me his child. And he's just waiting to hear from me. He's just waiting for me to say, God, I need your help. How does your father who is in heaven give what is good? And we ask, not a genie in the bottle, with our God. And so, I don't know what's going on in your life, but if it's like mine, we all suffer, don't we? We all have challenges. And I know the day either Jesus comes and delivers us or else we die. I get used to it. All it's going to be. Christian alike. Christian perhaps doubly because they're trying to walk after God and so the world's often against them. So we have a father that is ready and willing to act in our behalf if we just cry to him. Amen. People in the world are all alone. I don't know how you do that. And so that's why prayer is not a guilt thing. It's just like, I just can't wait to get on my knees to pray to God. Get behind me, Satan, telling me I'm not worthy, but God has made me worthy, and he wants to listen to me. And so I will run to him in prayer. Now, in all this, we have to understand that this effective prayer of a righteous man that accomplishes a lot. The word accomplishment means it's powerful. That's literally what it means. If you work prayer or live a life of prayer, if you just pray, it's powerful. Why? Not because of words. Not because of my inherent righteousness. Not because I pray a lot or pray a little. It's all powerful because of the one I'm praying to. That's God, right? Now, notice in our text, and we'll just review it very quickly, he says, you know, you know if, if you're suffering or if you're sick or if, if you have sins, he says, prayer restores. Prayer, the Lord's going to raise you up. The Lord will forgive. And it says, and he heals. See, prayer is powerful 100% because of what God does in the answer to prayer. And if you want to exclude God from your life and just go it alone, I'll give you the simplest way to do that. Just don't pray. Don't talk to him. Just keep him out of your life entirely that way. So it's not the words. It's not magic. It's God who hears. Maybe it's an issue of faith. Maybe it's an issue of trust. I think Sarah and Abraham had that problem. Remember when... God told Abraham, this time next year, you're going to have a child. And Sarah heard this, and we find that, that she laughed. And that's where God asks the question, is there anything too difficult for the Lord? Now, we could quickly say, oh, yeah. Or problems bigger than what he's able or willing to do in my life. Now, this question is asked many times because it's just a constant theme throughout Scripture that man doesn't understand how powerful God is, and they don't also understand his willingness to help us. And that's why this question is asked in Jeremiah in 32 and verse 17. It says, Behold, I am Jehovah, the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too difficult for me? Well, we honestly say no. Well, then why don't we pray? In Luke chapter 1, when uh, we find that Jesus is uh, promised to be born of a virgin, you know, Joseph's like, what? And the same question is asked or stated, nothing's impossible for the Lord. 
We find similar texts in uh, uh, Luke and Matthew when he talks, Jesus talks about how hard it is for a, a rich man to go to heaven. But Jesus says, all things are possible for the Lord. But my favorite one is in Mark chapter 9. A father is desperate about his son who is demon-possessed. And he can't do anything about it, so he feels helpless. You been there? A father and a child, helpless. He comes before Jesus, and he says, Lord, have compassion on our lives. And he says, if you can do anything, help us. Now, on one hand, we're going to give the guy a break because he's a father that's exasperated. He's played all his cards. Nothing works. He's desperate for the well-being of his child. What father or mother wouldn't be? So you can understand, if you can do anything, help us. But how does Jesus respond? Jesus, I don't know if he, his tone of his voice, and that's where scripture, when you just read the words, you don't know if it's rebuking or it's just amazing, but he comes back and says, if you can, now that's how I would say it, don't you realize who you're talking to? I created all this, if I can. Or it could have been a little more uh, understanding than I would have been. If I, you can. I'm going to show you what I can do. And so Jesus goes on to say, all things are possible to him who believes. It's not believe that he is the son of God. It's trust. See, what moves us to ask is that I trust God can and he will if I ask according to his will. Because God is desperate to work with those that walk with him. When he sees us walking on our own and doing our own thing, he'll let us be because we've told him, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And he says, fine, I'll let you go. But when we're calling on the Lord and we're seeking his will, his will is, is becoming mine. And we, we explore that by talking to him in prayer. We're working out this, this, this uh, struggle of my will versus his will. And we do that openly, talking to him in prayer. God, I'm struggling with this. Help me because I want to do this. And I know you don't want me to. When he sees that you want to walk with him, he will do anything that it takes to make it happen. That's his promise. And it's powerful. He casts out those demons in that son's, in that father's child's life. He'll cast out the demons in your life, anything you're struggling with. If we just go to him in prayer, and it's not we're guilting ourselves. It's like, wow, I didn't know I had such power available to me. Can we just close service so I can go in the back room and start praying? Now, praying, again, is not magical. It's just a conversation. I don't know what to say. Well, the best prayer is just a prayer that just gets on your knees and just says, God, I don't know what to say. I feel helpless right now. Would you help me? And God says, yeah, I'll be glad to. As a father blesses the child, the son. See, prayer is powerful, not because of ourselves, not because it's magical in the words. It's powerful because of the God who's listening to our prayers, Amen. who's willing to answer them when they're offered according to his will. Let's finish with a powerful example, Elijah. When you look at in the text in James chapter 5, we see in verse 17, he finishes the book. If James saw fit, I close, I'm going to tell you about Elijah. Now, Elijah, we learn something about Elijah, two things. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. The word like or nature has the word homo in it. In other words, the same as. He was just like you and me. There was, he's not a super righteous man. He had struggles. In fact, I find him in a cave once hiding because he's scared. Right? I find him another time he's hungry and God sent him food. And I, last time I find him in 1 Kings... He's under a juniper tree, and he is talking to God, and he says, God, just kill me. He's had it. He's desperate. He's a man just like you and me. So, okay, Elijah, I didn't know that. I thought you had it easy. I mean, you were a super prophet. 
slayed all those prophets of Baal, and he had no problems. You were taking them to heaven. No, he's just like you and me. What made Elijah so powerful? He prayed. And so here's what he mentions. And the sky poured forth rain, and it produced its fruit. Now, this is all back at the time of this conflict with King Ahab and uh, the, the, the false prophets on Mount Carmel. But you go back there and look, and Sam's been you know, teaching this in uh, morning class. Nowhere will you find in the text, in the Old Testament, it says that he prayed. The only way we know that Elijah prayed to cause the rain to stop falling is because James telling us that. The thing that ended the famine and caused the rain to come and end the drought because he prayed again. Whoa, I thought I couldn't control the weather. I guess I can by talking to the one who does. And that's actually how it happened. Now, it's interesting. When you look at this text. It says he prayed earnestly. And uh, Hebrew way of saying things. Literally, it means he prayed a prayer. Or with prayer, he, he prayed. It's kind of hard to translate into English. It's like us saying, I'm over in over my head or something. You know, we know what it means, the colloquialism when we say it. But to the Hebrews, they would understand this. He prayed a prayer. And it wasn't that he just prayed a prayer. It's the idea of he was fervent about it. He didn't finish until he knew God had heard him and was going to answer him. And that's why the, the English puts he prayed earnestly. But literally, it's he prayed a prayer. Or with prayer, he prayed. And that's all God's asking us to do. Just pray. Pray, pray, pray. Until God answers your prayer. Yes, no, or wait. For one another, so you may be healed. Because the effective of a righteous person can accomplish much. Let's go to God in prayer. Jehovah, our Father, the creator of all things that we know on this earth, we appeal to you as our Father. And God, the first thing I ask is that you might forgive us for not praying to you like we should, for trying to do things only on our own and leaving you out of our lives by refusing to talk to you in prayer. God, it's because we feel unworthy at times and because we doubt your promise that you will hear our prayers Perhaps it's, that is the reason why we don't talk to you as we should. And for that, God, we're sorry. In the same breath, we ask you to teach us to pray like your son taught his disciples to pray. And God, as we cry unto you and thank you for all the good things you've done for us, as well as bringing our request to you, we ask your answers in our life so we can be alive in our life, walking with us so our trust and faith in you may grow. And Father, we just thank you for Jesus because we know there's one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is our mediator and who now stands at your right hand and makes intercession for us. And so when we don't even know what to say, he What our hearts are trying to say. We thank you for his blood that it made us all righteous so we could pray to you in the first place. 
And in his name, we ask these things humbly. Amen. We're going to sing a song, Our God, He is Alive. As Eric comes forward now, if you want power in your life, have the creator of everything in your life, and you do that by becoming part of Jesus, by being baptized into his family, if we can help you, or if you need the prayers of this congregation, won't you come as we stand and sing this?